Well, we miss Pastor Jay tonight. Y'all know why I call him Pastor Jay, right? Because he's Jew and I'm Pastor G. I'm Gentile and together we're Jag, Jew and Gentile. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jew and Gentile. But hey, how many knows that Jew and Gentile is important? Did y'all know Jew and Gentile is important? Praise the Lord. Did you know that uh, some Gentile dude helped build the first temple? Did y'all know that? Did y'all know this guy named Hiram partnered with Solomon? And they built, it was, it's in this, this week's portion. 1 Kings chapter, chapter 5, that last verse in chapter 5. Jew and Gentile is important. Did you know what happened on the second temple too? Jew and Gentile working together to build the temple. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, and, it, and it's kings again. You ever heard of Cyrus? <laughs> Did you know he's a Gentile? <laughs> yeah, isn't that something? So, and, and so I wonder if on the third temple, if it's going to be Jew and Gentile. Isn't that something? Wouldn't that be awesome? Now, this week's portion has been a good, good study for me. I, uh, I talk a lot about giving. Giving is important. And this week's portion is, as you saw, as Sammy had spoken about, it's about giving. Giving. Think we're supposed to give, guys? It's an important thing for us to give, right? Let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for this time tonight. Lord, thank you for people that have gone before us, Lord, that have lived from their heart for you. Lord, thank you for that deep commitment, that deep commitment, Lord, that goes beyond what our minds can produce. It's so genuine and authentic, a love for you, a desire for your kingdom, a desire to commune with you and to worship you. Lord, tonight as we Open Your Word, sort of like breaking bread amongst ourselves. I ask, Lord, that You would feed us tonight by precious Holy Spirit. In the name of Yeshua, Amen. Exodus 25, verses 1-9. through 9. Now, as we were going through there, I'm just going to confess something, okay? I went, oh no! I put the verses in there and I didn't move, remove the fouls. Oh no. Well, Pastor Jay is going to get me for this. I just want to tell you I'm already in trouble. So brother, please forgive me. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, Exodus 25, 1 through 9. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. Read this again. Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that, may, that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. What is going on here? What is going on here? I want to show y'all a few things that led up to this. Where is Moses and the children of Israel right now? Where are they at? They're in the desert. Okay. Specifically, a little more specifically, where are they at? Where are they at? Mount Sinai. Okay. So back up in chapter 24, the last verse of chapter 24, Moses goes, it's, I'll read it to you, and Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount, and Moses 
was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights, and that's the second time for 40 nights. So that's the verse right ahead, okay? So that's that going up. I want to talk just a moment about the lay of the land. Y'all that have heard me enough, you know how I like to sort of look at Scripture. I like to get a lay of the land before I try to drill in. And in the words here in verse, uh, in the last verse of chapter 24, it says, And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, so I'm going to back up now to Exodus 19, verse 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God. You are going to hear that a little bit, okay? And the Lord called unto him out of the mount, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. So everybody say, Moses went up. Moses went up. Okay? Exodus 19, 7 through 8. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded him. So Moses came. He came down. He came down. He came down. He went up. He came down. He called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So he goes back up the mountain and he returns the word of the people to the Lord. Up and down, up and down. Verse 14, chapter 19. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. Verse 20, And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up up to the top of the mount. And Moses went up. <laughs> and the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down. This is verse 24 and 25. Okay? Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up. <laughs> thou and Aaron with thee, but let not the priests and the people break through to come up, up unto, the, unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. Exodus 24, 1-3. And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord. Moses come up, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. Verse 3. And Moses came and told the people all the words, so he goes back down. And all, the, and all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said will we do. Verse 9 of Exodus 24. Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nabat, Dab and Abihu and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw God, the God of Israel. And there was under his feet as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel he laid not his hand. Also they saw God and did eat and drink. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me, come up even further, into the mount, and be there. And I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and commandments, which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up in his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again. They're going to come back down. Unto you, and behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. Wow. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and gat him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. And that's the last verse there in chapter 24. Why do I do this exercise? Because I want you to see that Moses had some big thighs. <laughs> Moses did a lot of journeying on behalf of the people of Israel. He's 80 years old, guys. He's 80 years old. 
and the up and down and up and down and up and down. And he worked to get the word of the Lord into the people's ears. It's a job for preachers to try to get the word of the Lord to people. Sometimes people, and I, I'm a people, so I can speak on behalf of people somewhat. <laughs> people sometimes are hard to deal with. It's hard. It's hard. You know, there's a lot of pastors that uh, are hanging it up throughout our land. You know why? Because almost every call that they get is a problem. People are sometimes hard to deal with. And it's not like they're getting rich. Most of them are not getting <laughs> it's they, they have a burden. It's something inside of them that the Lord has birthed. I love the song, May the, the Lamb Receive the Reward of His Suffering. Isn't that great? And, and that reward is something beautiful that rises up inside of people in their heart. In their heart. In, in, in the portion here in Exodus 25, we, we emphasized that the Lord was telling Moses to tell them, the people, to bring a gift from their heart. It wasn't a tithe. It's a gift. Moses has journeyed up and down, up and down, up and down. Now we're at the point where God wants to dwell among the people. And Moses is really glad because he's 80 years old. <laughs> he's glad for a lot of reasons, but I'm telling you, it's hard. They've been on the road for three months now out of Egypt. They've been on the road out of Egypt for three months whenever he's here. He's fasted 40 days. He's been going up and down without much food, too. It's hard. He's really paid a price for the sake of the Word of the Lord being imputed and imparted and imputed into these people that they can hear and they can come out of their bondage fully. Now, isn't it interesting that from the place of their bondage that they had taken this great bounty, right? They had sort of pillaged the land of Egypt and they've got this gold and all of these things that we read about in their possession. And the Lord says, I want those who want to give a gift. I want you to take from the men who want to give a gift from their heart. And, and that's going to be the ones that I'm going to make my abode through. He's going to abide with. But the stuff that was used to put together the things, the tabernacle, and I'll show you in a minute the, the way the, the order is of this, the way that these material things come into being, at, the Lord tells Moses to make them according to the pattern I'll show you in the mount, and these things are made with the materials that were taken from the land of Egypt. Now, isn't it interesting how we go out and we work and we do and we make and we get and, and the Lord wants us to give from our heart. He wants us to give from our heart. Why does He want to give from us to give from our heart? Do you think it might be because He wants to make His abode through the things that we give in other people's lives? Do you think that those only that gave were the only ones to benefit from the abiding and continual presence of the Lord? Or was it everybody? You see, the place that the Lord wants to build, the church, the body, that precious Holy Spirit is putting together, it's, it's critical that there's people that are willing to give from their heart. Moses didn't go out and take by force. Those people were poor. They were really poor. They had been slaves. They didn't have much. All of a sudden they did though, right? Because they had pillaged the land. And they had, taken, had not taken it by force. They were sort of given all this stuff. And they got it and they go, wow, what I, oh. And along the way, over those three months, there had to be a connection with their heart. You see, wandering in the wilderness, some people do it in a way that they get hard and stingy and stiff, and they're not able to give from their heart. Because I have endured and I've done and had to go. 
and they sort of pull back and hold on to it. But there's others who might begin to see it as a burden, unnecessary. For what purpose am I carrying this gold around for for three months? For what purpose? What is the purpose of this? There's those that can give from the heart that can see the greater purpose. And those are the ones that the Lord is going to use what they have. Don't, isn't it honorable for what you have to be used for the glory of God? Isn't that honorable? Isn't that wonderful? I want to, I brought my phone up here because I want to read a letter to you guys. It's an email. Now, the Lord's been doing some amazing things at uh, Houses for Healing. And uh, I want to share one of those with you. There was, uh, anybody ever heard of the Complete Jewish Bible? Okay, well, the guy that wrote that, his name is David Stern. And, and David's son, Daniel, is my friend. He lives in Jerusalem. And Daniel sent an email to me because myself and two of our board members, and we don't have time tonight for me to tell you the whole story, but it's just packed with miracles. The Lord doing amazing, amazing things. So uh, we went down to Houston a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. I, don't, I think it's two, maybe yeah, two and a half weeks ago. Uh, Daniel says, Shalom, Brian, Carlin, and Rich. I spoke to Hadassah Hospital and Shahar, Shari Zedek Hospital, and they both seemed very interested. I also contacted a friend who works in a charity that provides bears for sick children, heart surgery, and cancer patients. And she directed me to two organizations that bring patients from abroad for surgery in Israel. I reached out to them as well to check for viability. She also offered to give bears to anyone staying in our home. Yuda and I will have a meeting on Sunday with Nativia's lawyer to start him working on whatever legal matters need to be done, and I will contact our insurance as well. Anyways, it looks like things are advancing nicely. As we discussed earlier, I think it would be suitable to schedule a visit to Israel to see the lay of the land and to get to know each other better. Blessings, Daniel Stern. So, Houses for Healing is going to be in Jerusalem. <laughs> is that amazing or what? That, that's the Lord. So, so uh, you know, whenever the Lord asked for the, the people from their heart to give the gift, they had no idea, they had no concept of the greatness that the Lord would work through that gift from the heart. And I'll tell you right now, that is just mind-boggling to me. I mean, how amazing is it that Abilene, the, the love that flows from the congregation here is being exported to, to Israel. Isn't that amazing? The, 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 the model that we're going to talk about when we go over there is what happens here. The way it ha Isn't that amazing? Jew and Gentile. Isn't that incredible? The, the Lord, only the Lord can do that. So what the plan is, Lord willing, is that uh, we'll rent an apartment and uh, we'll set up the model and we'll bring people from the States to go over there and stay in the hotel, I mean, into the, in the apartment for free. They'll stay there and it'll be two bedroom and, and, and the other room that they're not staying in will be for someone from Israel or from abroad that is fighting some kind of disease or has some kind of issue and they will care for them in that apartment like house parents. So involving Jew and Gentile, building the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazing? You see, whenever you take care of somebody like that, you can really share the gospel. It's against the law to proselytize there. But you can take care of a sick person who all of a sudden is aware of their mortality. And all of a sudden, the lay of the land changes. So these major hospitals saying, we're, in, we're interested in, who'd you say? Houses for healing? <laughs> That's the Lord's doing. That is, so when Jesus, Yeshua, sits on his throne, and Matthew 25, and the nations are brought, brought before him, 
And did you, hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick, prisoner, did you? Abilene stands up and says, Lord, we're right down the street from you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, whenever it first started, we didn't have any idea that the Lord was going to take something like that, and it wasn't much. It really wasn't much, but it is what we had. But the Lord has multiplied. The Lord has done it to bring us to a place where now then He is doing amazing things in Jerusalem. So, so think about how this will impact the church. If when you just, I see it, I was watching y'all, as I said, Jerusalem, to every one of you, your eyes were, you, why? Because you're drawn into that, right? Why? Because that's the foundational place. It's the foundational place of our faith. And so there's something about that word brethren. When you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you know, we know that that has a couple of meanings there. And when you do it, all of a sudden you're like, man, I'm getting a whole nother perspective on my brethren. A Jewish perspective on my bread, with the Lord saying it on my bread. I'm going, man, <laughs> amen. I want to do that, Lord. I want to do that. See, that's what the Lord can take you into whenever you're willing to give from your heart. Some people just had some threads, right? Some had the fine linen, some had the badger skin, or some had, I don't know how they got that stuff, but apparently they had been doing it there in Egypt, you know, so that whenever they left the land, they were just given it. I don't know how they got ram's skin dyed red, and there's some interesting things you can read about that as to what it really might have been. We don't really know. There's a lot of good conjecture out there, though, but it's, uh, yeah, I don't know how, but, but it's exactly what the Lord wanted to use. Isn't that amazing? Would you believe that they had in their possession exactly what the Lord wanted to use? And we do too. We have in our possession exactly what the Lord wants to use. Now I was going to take you through the, the things that they made because I, I, I like the order that the Lord had them do things in. The, the way that they, you know, in fact I went through my Bible and I was marking, oh this was number one and oh this was number two and number three. It's very interesting. You should do it. See what the Lord had them make in the order that he had them make it so you can sort of see importance, right? Did you know that the mercy seat wasn't made number one? There had to be the place for the mercy to rest. The ark was number one. That's what he made first. A place for the mercy to rest. Isn't that interesting? Don't you know that mercy needs a place to set, settle on? But the only place worthy was the box that represents Yeshua. And on the inside, the word, the law, would be contained. That it didn't go out and condemn, but it was contained under the mercy. Isn't that amazing? And he does all of these things in an order. And he shows us a beautiful, beautiful picture. Now, because it's 8.55, I'm going to have to jump to the end. But there is the process of a lot of the articles of the, the tabernacle. The tabernacle itself, uh, the, the garments, and the consecration of the priesthood, and, and the, the, the outer court, the altar, the, the brazen laver, all, all these things that, that are made. And, and you get several chapters down, down the line before you, and I left, I didn't mention just now the, the lampstand and the table of showbread that are inside the, the inner part of the, the tabernacle there, but and talks about the veil, but, but you don't get to the altar of incense. You know what the altar of incense represents? What does it represent? It represents the prayers of the saints. That's where they would burn the incense, and, and there's a representation there of our prayers. And that thing wasn't built until way, way down the road. Why? Why was it built way down the line? Well, our prayers, remember what Sammy was talking about, about the, the, the Lord wants the place, the mercy seat, to commune with us, right? 
He wants a place to commune with the, the mercy seat. He was going to commune with Moses there. And then we know whenever Yeshua died, that veil was torn in two. So we can all go before the throne of... What can we go before? Y'all help me out. We can go through the throne of mercy or grace. We can go and we can go approach His throne boldly, right? We can, and, and on the other side of that, there's this altar of incense. Remember, that's where John, John's daddy, Zachariah, he was there when Gabriel came. Y'all remember that? So he was burning incense. That was his lot. That's his task in his assignment. That, that time, it was, uh, he was in there burning that incense. And we do a little cross-referencing into Revelation and stuff. And we see that this incense, is it just represents the prayers of the saints. It's a sweet savor going up to the Lord. And our prayers rise up. They, the incense would be burned. And you ever go through hard times, and boy, you can really pray during the hot times, the hard times. Right? That's when you can really pray. That's when I learned how to pray. The greatest agony of my life, that's when I learned how to pray the best. And that's when I experienced the greatest presence of the Lord. When I couldn't sleep at night, when the darkness would seem to choke the life out of me. And I would just roll over and hit my knees. And I didn't care who heard me. I didn't care if I waked up, woke people up. I, I didn't care because I was so desperate. And that's when I learned really how to pray. Really, and so this represents the present, and that doesn't happen till at the very end. Why? Well, isn't it interesting that sometimes, for the holiness of the Lord to have His habitation, we need to be quiet. Sometimes we need to be quiet. Do you know that the Holy of Holies? It was very, very, very. There's a time we, we went to. There's a black uh, pastor friend of mine, and he was going to have a 30 days of prayer, and uh, and and we're buddies. I love him, and but I wasn't accustomed to their approach. Okay, but I learned something. I'd get the boys up, and we didn't go every day, but we went quite a number of days. We'd go there early in the morning before school, and and we would go in and pray to to help them, to encourage them, because they're our brothers, right? And we want to do this to encourage them, to help them be strong in their community, to do what God has called them to do there, right? That's what we're supposed to do as the body of Christ. And so we'd go there, and I would watch him. He'd, he'd set over to the side, and he'd look up here toward where the lectern was at on, on the, the pulpit. And uh, it was really quiet. Now, I usually, I'm, I, I'll talk and pray out loud and stuff when I pray. So this is different because it's really quiet. And I, I began to wonder, why are they doing that? And then I began to see the others, the reverence that they had for the, the house. And, and it clicked one day, several days into it, they are reverencing the holiness of the Lord. They're reverencing the holiness of the Lord. I thought, how beautiful, how awesome. We don't do that. The holiness of the Lord is incredibly important. And believe me, it commands our attention, it commands our being. It, it actually eliminates whatever will not submit. It, and it's, the holiness of God is incredible. That altar of incense is way, way down the line. And I thought, you know, the Lord established the places of His presence. The representations of His Son, of precious Holy Spirit, of the bread, of of all these things, and he says, now, and, and guess where you're in the midst of? You're in the midst of these articles, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. You're in the midst of them. And then the, the, the incense goes up, and it would waft over behind the veil there to the mercy seat, and your prayers are heard. So I just thought that was a beautiful, beautiful illustration of how the Lord was situated there. And it all started with somebody giving a gift, right? From their heart. And then all of this things, these things that the Lord wanted to do so that our prayers could be the fullness of His presence is what I'm talking about. The fullness of the presence of the Lord that He wanted to manifest. It happened because somebody gave from their heart. Moses followed all the instructions. He built things just like He was showed. And, and then, at the end, the last one, that altar of incense, and we go in there and we can approach the Lord 
in a right way. Isn't that amazing? You see the impact of your gift given from your heart for the purpose of establishing the presence of the Lord can be talked about for thousands of years. Isn't that amazing? You don't know what a little bitty tiny gift might be, but it's something that if given right, after you've done what you're supposed to given all of a sudden it becomes powerful forever. Let's bow together.